Okay, we have a very exciting topic to hit on today that's going to build on what we've covered in recent sessions, but which is going to really mark the jumping off point for some important implications of what we've been seeing for data science. Uh, and it has to do with uh, the difference between linear and nonlinear systems. And we're going to be covering this in some detail today in a set of slides that I haven't yet shared with Moodle, but maybe I'll do so now in case you want to, to grab them. Um, I, I did a fair bit of working. And just while I'm doing this, I want to emphasize um, sort of a, a high-level feature of this lecture because there's going to be a fair bit of mathematical notation and specifics in this lecture. And it, but it's towards an end. It's towards an end of communicating some features of this situation of great importance for this enterprise of system science, data, system data science that I've articulated in, uh, in other contexts and that will play an important role within this class, okay? Um, and specifically, I would like to, uh, to emphasize in this lecture a profound, a, a difference between linear and nonlinear systems that has profound implications for our ability to analyze systems using the tools of data science. Okay? Um, many of the tools of which we will be exploring here in coming weeks. And whilst this won't reflect the close of our work with uh, exploring these four perspectives on modeling, it will sort of start to orient us towards the coming module on systems data science. And indeed, that will be gathering steam in coming lectures as we explore nonlinear systems, okay? Now, the reason that uh, that we're going to be taking that on as a challenge for nonlinear systems is because with nonlinear systems, we have this phenomenon that um, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We, we have a system that cannot merely be reduced into its pieces. By contrast, in linear systems, the behavior of the whole is, is really the sum of, of the parts. That each of those parts basically contributes in a fairly straightforward way to the, to the system as a whole. And if we want to understand how the system as a whole responds to some input, we can do so by simply considering how it responds to the decomposition of the input into characteristic pieces. And if we know how the system responds to each of those pieces, we know how it responds to the whole. Um, we have systems which are maybe composed of many pieces, but their behavior is really, at some level, it's sort of a sum of the, the various pieces. The whole is equal to the sum of the parts, so to speak. And, and with nonlinear systems, this is going to change radically. One implication of this for linear systems is if we have a linear system that's nominally coupled, where the different pieces seem to depend on one another causally, you know, with a system such as, as this guy or this guy here, one of these two, where, you know, it, at the top this the evolution of x2 is coupled with, it seems, the evolution of x. Or in the bottom right, the second order delay where y is coupled to x. The truth is with linear systems, 
this is just in a manner of, true in a manner of speaking. It's, it's just true depending on a certain uh, way of describing the system. And we can choose another way of describing these linear systems where they're totally decoupled. Okay, where we can express these same systems just using different way of characterizing it, a change of variables, a different coordinate system as it were. And these two systems, uh, the bottom right one, instead of consisting of two coupled pieces, will consist of two pieces independently evolving. And the same thing is true in the upper, upper part. And in general with linear systems, we, we can shape, take a certain stance, a sort of natural stance with respect to the system, and recharacterize it in a way that the coupling disappears. It's just a bunch of solitudes evolving independently. And that's convenient for us as engineers, for example, because it allows us to then reason about the system in a decoupled way. We don't have this tangling that confuses our characterization. But when it comes to, when it comes to uh, the, the prospect of data science, um, often if we have a system that can be decomposed into its pieces independently, um, it makes it harder at a certain level to make sense of, of one piece of data to, in terms of knowing what it tells us about the system as a whole. The piece of data might tell us about one piece of the system, but in a decoupled system, that doesn't tell us anything about the broader, the broader, the rest of the system. But one of the features of nonlinear systems is that we're not going to be able to characterize them in this way that by taking a certain stance, it, it all appears decoupled. They're inherently coupled. They're inherently tangled. They're tangled in a way we can't untangle them. And for data science, this is going to have huge implications. Because what it means is that a given, if we know about a given piece of the system, it tells us about the rest of the system. It tells us about broad areas of the system. It can give us great insight from a few pieces of data that happen to be taken from one place can give us broad insight about what's going on elsewhere. It's this inherent tangling or coupling of nonlinear systems which makes them so gnarly to deal with, so difficult to, to reason about and to manage, but at the same time gives the tools of data science a special power and, and uh, a special significance in understanding the evolution of those systems. And that's where we're going. That's where we're going with this course. That's where we're going with the next bunch of lectures. And we're going to be explicating this in, in, in more detail. And today we're going to take our first few faltering steps towards that with a fair bit of math, but with that noble goal in mind of being able to reason about reliably these broader tangled systems from small pieces of them. Okay? Um, and our first few faltering steps in that direction that we're starting with today, with which we start with today, are going to take a look at linear systems and recharacterizing them in, a, uh, in an independent way. Re reframing them in a way that decouples them. And I do so to contrapose these positions with nonlinear systems, but also to make an essential point of great importance to data science. We'll look at how we can rephrase a linear system in a decoupled way. In, in a way that simplifies our worries. We, we, we characterize it as evolving solitudes. We don't have to worry about one if we're trying to solve for the other. You know, simplifies our, we have a separation of concerns. But the, the reframing of these systems in a decoupled way doesn't reduce the number of state variables that we're dealing with. We're still, if we started with two state variables, like in the lower right here, 
the, the decoupled system will have two state variables. So it'll just be two independent state variables, two state variables that don't depend on one another. Okay. Same thing with the upper thing of the left. And in general, if we had a hundred dimensional system, we have a hundred stocks, a hundred elements of state, we will end up having in the decoupled system a hundred elements of state. There are exceptions, conservation laws, symmetries, etc. But um, but fundamentally the the decoupled systems will have the same dimensionality. Okay. And what that means is there's a certain lack of ability, again, for us to, to reason about the system with, with fewer than two elements of information to fill in a complete picture. With coupled systems, we're going to have the ability with these, these gnarly nonlinear coupled systems, one part of, a, of seeing one part and knowing about the whole is that Often they will have a dimen an intrinsic dimensionality, an intrinsic sort of degree of flexibility or variability within their state space that's vastly less than their nominal, their sort of uh, apparent dimensionality. So we may have a highly coupled system of, of you know, three stocks, but it boils down to one piece of information, one number can summarize basically its state because they're so coupled telling you about one, tells you about the other, and I could just specify one thing and it will tell you all you need to know about all three elements. Or maybe it's a hundred degree system, but I can boil it down into just three dimensions because it's so coupled. And the world is like this, ladies and gentlemen, with so many systems. And when it comes to human behavior and human health, when it comes to geology, it's like this. Things are coupled. Things are linked. What goes on in one place so strongly influences the other that if you tell me just a little bit about one thing, it tells me largely about the other. And what that means is those systems, far from being you know, a two-dimensional system, that, it, that explores this entire space, state space of possible, possible elements. Instead, in those systems, those nonlinear highly coupled systems, we may be exploring a thin manifold, a thin sort of uh, curve in this space. And we're only really going back and forth really a lower dimension. Or maybe instead of being two dimensions in this board, this is three dimensions. But all we're exploring is you know, the equivalent of a piece of paper that's in that. It's in three dimensions. A piece of paper is in three dimensions, but it's essentially two dimensions. It's really only, you know, it's, it's a 2D surface to describe where I am. I really only need two coordinates, and I can, I can figure out the third, even though it may be bad in 3D space. So with coupled nonlinear systems, often we have a nominal state space that may be large. With agent-based models, we may have a nominal state space that's you know, combinatorially large. Maybe you have each person in a hundred person state space who can nominally be in one of three states, susceptible, infected, and recovered. Right? Hmm? Each person in the hundred person population could be susceptible, infected, recovered. So that's what we mean when we say nominal. Um, when I say nominal, I mean the apparent one, like the naive one. If you look at it, what you would think. Or the one it's phrased in. Like, like this, this one here, X and Y, it's phrased as, as two coupled states. Okay. Um, this, this is nominally two, a, a coupled system of two equations. That's, that we say it's nominally because that's how it's, it's named. It's kind of, we refer to it, it's described that way. But the underlying reality is we can reframe this in a far lower dimensional way. Oh, sorry, excuse me, I, I take that back. Not lower dimensional way. We can reframe this in a decoupled way. So nominally this is a coupled system 
but in fact, in terms of its intrinsic character, it, it, it could be characterized as a decoupled system. Okay, and what I'm I'm applying that same sort of analogy here, or same sort of terminology here. When I say nominally, we may be given a model where we have a you know a population of 100 agents, or say an n agents in general, right? Um, and each of those agents can be, say, one of three states, susceptible, infected, recovered, but they're connected via a network. And, you know, in principle, nominally, you know, looked at at an apparent level, each of these states can be in any one of those three, right? So if we have one state, one person, they could be either susceptible, infected, or recovered, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, Three possibilities. Maybe they go go back here, right? Um, they can win, win immunity, and there are a couple. So each person, the first person, could be in any of three states, right? The second person could be in any of how many states? Three states. Third, three. In terms of the set of possible states, the whole system could be. If we have to go through and count how many possibilities are there, what is this one? Three. Three for that one. Three for that one. And in general, this would be three to the n, right? Which is a big number, and it's like 100. Um, and, and so nominally, there's a massive number of states this system could be in. But if you actually look at intrinsic state space, the actual explored state space, um, there's a tremendous number of these states you're never going to get to with any, any reliable thing on um, reliable model. Instead, it's going to be carving out a very thin manifold, a very thin subsurface of this three to the hundred associated with the natural dynamics of the system. You know, and it's going to be oscillating or what have you. So, so the point is that um, when we have systems that are coupled, that doesn't look good. Um, um, when we have systems that are coupled, um, what what on the face of it looks like an unbelievable number of possibilities, in fact, boils down to a very small number of actualized possibilities of, of a number of, of in fact realistic possibilities. If I want to use the word, that, right? And our systems are like that in the world. Knowing about one fortune tells you about all sorts of fortunes, you know. If you, if you were to find a random point in the day and you were to say, where is Professor Osgood? And you find out, oh, okay, he's, he's in this classroom teaching a lecture. That tells you a huge amount about my behavior, right? I'm not doing my morning workout here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sitting here and, you know, sleeping, right? Um, I'm, I'm not... I hope I'm not using this as a washroom, you know. Um, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, here um, going through and, and through my emails, right? Knowing about one thing tells you a lot about my other. It tells me about my physical activity level in this room. Um, I'm probably standing and walking around a little bit, but I'm not totally sedentary. It tells you about my verbal behavior. I'm probably not sitting here mute. It tells you about my cognitive behavior. Hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm not in a sleeping sort of state, you know, uh, cognitively. It tells you about all sorts of aspects of my behavior for knowing one thing, that I'm here in front of the class, right? And it tells you about your behavior. You're, you're not engaged in, you know, moderate to vigorous physical activity, <laughs> and you're not engaged in, um, you know, sleeping behavior, um, at least most of you. and. Uh, you know, uh, you're not engaged in, you know, um, use of, in, in, uh, a, a focal use of smartphones um, during my lecture, uh, et cetera. So knowing about one part of a system tells you about many parts of a system, okay, um, in, a, in a coupled nonlinear system. We're going to see that for, for linear systems, um, in fact, we can't reduce the dimensionality, typically, um, in this way by decoupling them. We can re-describe them in a decoupled way, but, but they're, 
they have just as many elements of state. It's by virtue of the fact that we cannot recast these nonlinear systems in a decoupled way that we can start to reason about their about them in a more um, expansive way from the, with the tools of data science. That a piece of one a piece of knowledge about one part of the system will tell you a world of knowledge about the rest of the system. Um, it's, it's, it, that coupling gives us great insight from, in terms of data collection. Okay. Um, so this is where we're going. And we're going to begin today with um, some explorations that are rooted in linear systems and in linear algebra. Okay. Um, so you'll recall from this floor within the past few lectures, I articulated four different common ways that we characterize the action of a matrix. And in various expositions within the past few weeks, I've gone from one characterization to another. For example, I'm characterizing the action of a, of a Jacobian on some displacement factor. We've, you know, we've, we've kind of thought of it as, as as, as having a sort of um, having a, a certain displacement that serves as kind of weights going in this direction so much, that direction so much, so much that direction, and, and you know we have uh, we have the, the Jacobian times that is giving us kind of that weighted sum um, uh, of, of by this uh, by this uh, of, of each dot product of each row I should say of each row by a, by a vector by this dot product with a vector. Um, I'm going to be focusing on another perspective here and the way that some of the columns of the matrix here. Um, last time we talked about this sort of mapping of row space vector two times ago to a, to a, um, a column vector, okay? Oh, excuse me, the, la the last one. Uh, no, it was the, the third one. Okay, last time. Okay, so um, you'll recall that we can think of uh, products of a matrix by a vector is kind of a weighted sum of the columns. So here, each of the x's um, tells us how much of each of the columns of A do we want. It's kind of like we're placing an order, right, in a food kiosk. We're saying, I want this much of that one, that much of that one, that much of that one. Um, uh, and here, x represents sort of how much of each column, for successive columns, each element of x tells us how much of the corresponding column uh, we want, okay? And the reason of this should be pretty clear if you think about how matrix multiplication works. Um, you know, if we think about, you know, a matrix here um, with various elements in it, right? And we think about a, a vector here, um, the result is, by multiplying this matrix by a vector, assuming they're compatible, we will get out a vector, right? Right? And the, you could tell by my lining it up, if, if this is an N by M matrix, the input vector has got to be an element of R to the what? Well, we need one element of it for every We need one element of this vector for every column, right, of this matrix, right? Um, uh, so I'm calling this an M by, by N matrix here. Um, so we need an equal number of elements in this, in this input vector to the number of columns. And the output vector will be uh, an element of what? So this input vector is an element of um, reals to the, the number of columns, and the output vector is reals to the what? Number of rows of the matrix, right? Right, if there's n rows, then it'll be uh, r to the n, right? Okay, and where does each element of this matrix um, come from? Well, 
you know, if we have A here, B here, C here, etc. For each element here, it's going to come from a from a dot product, right, of, of this row with this column. And so A is always going to be multiplied by the first by the first column here, right? B is always going to be multiplied by the second column, uh, C by the third. So A tells us, like, for our output, our takeaway from the from the food kiosk, how much of column one do we want, right? If 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 this input vector is, if this is y equals ax, if x is first element if, is one, and all the rest are zero, what do we get out? We get out the first, if, if this is one and all the rest are zero, what do we get as a result of the matrix multiplication? First the first column of the, of the matrix, right? If, if this, vector is 0, 1, 0, 0, if only the second element is 1, what do we get out? The second column, similarly for the third and so on. And in general, if, if you know, A is 1 and B is 1, we say I'll have one serving of that and one serving of this, right? And we get them from our buffet, the matrix buffet, right? So, so this vector can be viewed as telling us how much of each column we want, right? And we get that much out, okay? This is gonna be critical for understanding a few steps in the linear algebra coming up. Um, I said goreward reference. <laughs> okay, uh, this should be a, a forward reference. I had a forward reference in earlier slides, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, so here, we can think of this matrix as transforming um, from one encoding of vectors uh, to another, okay? Um, so if we have y equals ax, it gives us a vector that, that has x amount to each of the columns of a, okay? And if we, if we flip that around, this is critical. This point of reasoning is critical to understand what's coming up. If I have y equals ax, Basically, y, the output, is basically tells us what vector has, has each of these elements of x is amount of the columns of x in it, right? That was, that was crudely put, but x is telling us how much of each column of a we want, and that's what will give us y, right? So by the flip side, if we were to multiplied by A inverse on both sides, and I'm assuming this is possible, I don't want to get into that rat hole. If we assume multiplied by A inverse on both sides, we get A inverse times Y equals X. So in other words, what this is telling us, what is X telling us here? The output here, if we have A inverse Y equals X, the result of A inverse Y is telling us how much of each of the columns of A is in Y, right? That's what it's telling us. It's telling, hey, how much of column one is in Y? How, how much of column two is in Y? How much of column three is in Y? That's what this gives us. It gives us a, a statement of what Y is in the column space of this matrix. It tells us how much of of, of, of how much of each column of A is there in each of the elements of Y. And in general, you can think of this matrix as kind of multiplying by a vector that tells us how much of each column we want, and it will give us, it will give us a resulting vector that has that much of each column. And here, by multiplying by A inverse, we, we get back that, that sort of, um, and that order how much we of each column uh, we have in y. Does that make sense to people? So this is going to give us how much of each of the columns of A are in y. It's going to be central for what's coming up. Okay. Okay. So if I had more time in this course, I'd talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But I trust that you will remember from your undergrad 
undergrad uh, courses, and of course in linear algebra, the notion of an eigenvector. What is an eigenvector for a matrix? At, at, a, at a rough level. Well, it's a vector such that we have an eigenvector E. It's a vector such that if this is an eigenvector of A, if E is an eigenvector of A, if we multiply A times E, what do we get back? Get back just a scalar, this is a number times E. So if we operate, if we apply A to E, we get back E, just scaled, just just sort of stretched or, or, or shrunk. It's in the same direction. E is in some direction, right? E is a vector, it's like pointing over there or something like that. And if it's an eigenvector of a, of a certain matrix, when I multiply that matrix times it, it'll give me something in that same direction, just, just smaller, longer, or shorter. But it's in the same direction. It's just scaled by, by lambda. So maybe lambda is 0.5, and so it'll, it's a vector in that same direction, but half as long. Or maybe it's two. It's a vector in that same direction, but twice as long, right? That's, that's the property of an eigenvector vector and its accompanying eigenvalue. And it's kind of the natural, the natural, it's a natural vector of A. It's kind of a, a characteristic vector of A, if I can use that word informally, not in its, its formal mathematical sense, but it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of uh, natural way of, just, of, of uh, it's a, it's, it's, it's a natural way of sort of pointing for A. And it, form, it turns out this will form an eigenbasis for uh, areas of matrices, a sort of natural coordinate system for those matrices. Okay, so suppose we have vectors, um, x1, x2, x3. Each of these is a vector, okay? So each of them looks like this, x sub i, comma, they have a first element, and they have a second element, and they have n elements, okay? So this is for x, xi. So we picked some xi. If this were x1, we'd have x11, x12, x13, etc. Right? Does that make sense? OK. So each of these vectors has elements. That's what I'm saying, right? It has n, n elements. OK. Now, if we have those vectors, in general, we could create a, a matrix of those vectors, right? I mean, I'm talking about any old vector here for now. If we have a matrix of vectors, they're all the same length. They all are elements of R to the N. They're all length N, N elements. We can create a matrix by just sticking each of those vectors as the columns of the matrix, right? Yeah, those matrix is nothing more than taking these vectors, lining them up like a phalanx, and putting them into a, a box. Don't think of box, the matrices as boxes and numbers, but occasionally it's useful to just have that visual image. And so here we've taken each of these vectors, which are in the same dimension, we've lined them up. Are we okay with that? Now I want you to, th to reflect on the fact that if we have a, another matrix, oh, now your head's spinning. If you have another matrix A, that we multiply by this matrix X of these vectors, the result is just gonna be, a matrix with columns, and each of those columns is going to be A times the corresponding vector, okay? So, so look, if this, if this matrix X, I'll write it over here using the same kind of notation. If X is, consists of this matrix where the first column is X1, right? And the second column is X2, right? and the third column is x3, right? And so on, right? All the way up to xm, right? If that's what this matrix looks like, right? If we go and we say, I wanna know what ax is, right? You think about how A operates on a matrix, right? Um, how is A gonna operate on this? Well, if, if you need to think, unpack it, 
to how matrix multiplication works. Here we have A, right? We have A, and it has some, some rows and, and some vectors, right? And here we have X, right? And it has these various things that we've just shown up there, right? Um, X2, et cetera, right? Are we comfortable with this? Okay, think about how this first column, right? I mean, this matrix times this compatible matrix, right? The number of columns of A has to equal the number of rows of X, yeah? But if they're compatible, right? Where does this first column of AX come from? So if this is AX, where does the first column of it come from? Well, when you think about it, right? It's, it's uh, okay, so... So what we've got is the thing that goes into here is the result of multiplying each of these rows times, times this first column of X, each of these rows of A times the first column of X, right? And that's just what? That's just like AX1, right? That's just AX1, right? And this, this next column, where does it come from? What, what is it gonna be? X2, right? X2. These are, these are columns. They're not just, you know, numbers. They're not just scalars. These are columns. Are we okay with that? Okay, hearing no revolts in the masses. Um, uh, uh, here, M, right? M, yeah. Um, that, that's, that's where this matrix comes from, right? That's all we have, right? You know, this is going to be key for our reasoning in this next step. Because now, having walked you through that, I'm going to combine these factoids that we've walked through, these three, three factoids. So I'm combining the first with, these, with the second, third, and fourth on the other hand. Okay? So suppose now that we don't merely have any old matrix X, so a vector of any old vectors, X1, X2, X3, so on. Suppose that we have very particular vectors named E, and guess what those vectors are? Eigenvectors. Those are our eigenvectors, okay? And there are eigenvectors of what matrix? Of A, right? There are eigenvectors of A. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we have that, then, okay, look, I mean, this is called S, but it's just just a very specific form of what we call the X, right? This matrix of columns, where the columns are just specific vectors. The columns here just happen to be the eigenvectors of A. So if we have that, if we consider A S, what do we get as its first column? If if the if the the vectors we call them instead of X one, we call it E one. In in this matrix S what we had called X in its more general case, what's the first column of AS? It's just AE1, right? If E1 is just that, that first column of S, just like up here, we get AE1, right? I, I mean, you don't need me to do it, but if I went through and I changed this all to E instead of X, you get AE1, right? But what is AE1? If, if E is an eigenvector, what is AE1? Lambda 1 times E1, right? And, then, and each of them has a very particular eigenvalue associated with it. You have to pair up the eigenvalues with the appropriate eigenvectors, right? If it's E1 is the first eigenvector, then lambda 1 has to be the first eigenvalue, the, the eigenvalue that accompanies it. Same thing with E2, E3, etc. right? Okay. Okay, now, in a bit of sleight of hand, it's not sleight of hand, it's just, it's just kind of a, a convenient way to write this that, that is, is true. We can rewrite this as just S, Okay, look, I mean, S was this matrix of eigen, eigenvectors where each is a column. We can just rewrite that as S times lambda one, 
Well, uh, time to matrix. Okay, so you might say, well, wait a minute. Um, uh, what do you mean a matrix? Um, well, okay, hear me out. S, S is just this matrix of E1, E2, E3, E4, right? So if we have S times this matrix, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, all the way to lambda M, um, think about how this plays out, right? Remember multiplying a matrix uh, by a vector. Remember how multiplying a matrix times a vector worked? Remember we talked about it earlier, right? Um, suppose that vector has only one in the first element. We multiply this matrix, a, uh, we multiply a matrix, let's call it a matrix this time, we'll call it S, times this vector where it's just the, only the first element in that vector is, is one and the rest are zero. What do we get out? You would get out the first column of the matrix, right? You get that? If, if that vector had zero, one, and all the rest zero, we get, if we multiply that matrix times a vector, we get the second column of that matrix out, right? So suppose the first column of the matrix, indeed, it's, it's like one, zero, 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 zero. But instead of one, it's lambda one. What do we get out? First column, uh, okay. So we get out, so if we multiply S, here, the, the matrix, by a vector, which instead of being one, remember, we multiply S by a vector one, zero, 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 zero. We get out the first column of X, right? If we multiply it by, let's, let's just simplify, we'll say two, zero, 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 zero. What do we get out? Twice the first column of X. It'll just be two times, it, right? Because it's, it's, instead of one, times it, it's going to be two times it, right? Do you get that? Because look, I mean, remember, each element of the output vector, is what we're having S times some vector. Each element of the output vector is just taken from the dot product of the rows of S times that vector, right? So we have S times some vector V, right? If and each <laughs> The output vector is just coming from the dot product of the rows of S times with the dot product with V, right? If, if, if V is one, zero, 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 yeah, we get the first element of each row multiplied by one plus zero times an S, zero times an S, da, 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 right? If the first element is two, we get two times this, the whatever in this column of the matrix, right? plus zero, 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 right? If the first element is three, we get three times it. If the first element is lambda one, we get lambda one times the first column of, of that matrix, right? And that, that's, that's what's occurring here. So, so S times this weird looking matrix, actually it's not weird, but it's beautiful, but, but I'm not gonna ask you to go out on the limb to declare that yet, okay? Um, uh, S times this matrix is going to be a, well, S is a matrix, this is a matrix, and the result is gonna be a matrix. And I could go in about the rows and columns, but, but the point is, the first column of this matrix is gonna be what? The first column of S times lambda one. The second, the second column is going to be the second column of S times lambda 2. The last column is going to be the last column of S times lambda lambda M, right? Which is just what I've written on the right, or the left here. This, this kind of thing, this thing here. Um, realizing that each of the columns of S are just E1, E2, E3, and so on. Which happened to be the eigenvectors of A, right? Those are the eigenvectors of A. So, so it turns out AS, A times, remind me what S is, what is S? A matrix of eigenvectors, AS equals S times 
this lamb this sort of funny matrix with lambdas in it, right? But ladies and gentlemen, which entries all have any any non-trivial number in this matrix? Which which entries have a non-zero number? I'll put it that way. I don't want to say zero is trivial. Zero is far from trivial. Um, but which which entries of this matrix are non-zero? So the diagonal ones uh, only. The rest is zero. This is a diagonal matrix, and by the by convention and matrix notation, we like to write diagonal matrices as delta. Okay, or sorry, this is lambda. What am I saying, delta? Oh my gosh. No, it's lambda. It's lambda. It's a big lambda. You are you familiar with, with uh, Jerry Sussman's papers? Lambda, the ultimate imperative. Lambda, the ultimate declarative. And there's, there's, I think, some more as well. Um, lambda, the ultimate something or other. Um, they're gorgeous papers. Um, they're, I mean, they're really interesting um, point-wise. Uh, Dr. Duchin would certainly agree with my assessment. Um, um, okay. So, so it follows, if I just put the two sides of this together, AS equals S lambda. Do you get that? That's what it, it is. I mean, it, it follows this through, these being eigenvectors. It's the eigenvectors in S. S is the matrix of eigenvectors of A. And if you multiply A times the matrix of eigenvectors, you get out something that's the same as that matrix of eigenvectors times these deltas. Because the eigenvectors just scale the appropriate, uh, sorry, the eigen uh, S, multiplying S times its eigenvalues just leads to a scaling of that eigenvalue. And that, that's how it's written, okay? So given this is the case, If it's a nice situation, I'm not going to go into that, involving orthonormal eigenvectors, or even just normal eigenvectors. They don't have to be orthonormal. Um, AS equals S lambda. By straightforward matrix multiplication, multiplying on the left by S inverse, we get S inverse AS equals delta. This is called diagonalizing the matrix. We diagonalize A by pre-multiplication by its matrix of eigenvectors and, and post-multiplication by the inverse of that matrix. Or, if we flip it around the other way, we multiply in the right by S inverse, we get A equals S delta S inverse. Okay? Now, these may look like, yeah, what about it? But the, the implications of this are profound. They are profound. Okay, so let's let's talk just a little bit about them. So look, if we have a times some vector, we can think of this equally much so as s lambda s inverse times that same vector. So, and we can think of this as look taking vector, we. We basically figure out how much of each of the eigenvectors are in it. That's what this S minus 1 is. Remember, remember this idea I said two, lectures, two, two slides ago? Remember this? This idea is, look, if you multiply by, if we have y equals ax, it tells us what is the vector y that has x amount of each of the columns of a in it, right? Right? That's what that is, y equals ax, right? Remember, X is just like a menu. I say, I want, I'm at a buffet and they serve me. And I say, I want this much of that one, that much of that one, right? Um, and they'll give it to me, right? Right? Y equal X, that's what it gives you, right? And by the same token, I argued, if you have A inverse Y, it tells you the X, how much you'd have to order of each of the, the, the columns of A to get Y. It takes y and it, it tells you how much of each of the columns of A are in it, right? Do, do you see that? And that's what S inverse is here, ladies and gentlemen. It's telling you how much of each of the columns of S are in V. And what are the columns of S? 
Those are the eigenvectors. So what's happening here is we take V and we decompose it into the eigenvectors. We figure out how much of the eigenvectors in it. We re-express V in sort of the eigen basis, okay? Um, we re-express it into the, um, by, by, by reframing it as, um, you know, one, zero, zero, zero would tell us there's one of the first eigenvector and zero of the other. Right? Or 2, 0, 0 would tell us there's 2 of the second eigenvalue. Sorry, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0 would tell us that. Um, okay, so if we take V and we multiply it by that, we're transforming it into this eigenbasis where we're describing things of how much of the, each of the eigenvectors are, how much of the first eigenvector, how much of the second eigenvector, how much of the third. And then if we know the description of the system, in terms of the eigenvectors, there's, I got this much of this one, this much of the second one, this much of the third one. Then the action of A is simply expressed in those eigenvector, and that eigenvector makes it, acting A on an eigenvector just stretches that eigenvector, right? It doesn't change the direction. So if we know how much of each of it there is, to figure out if we applied A to V, how much of that eigenvector we get? It would just be delta, which tells us how much each one is stretched, times this. That tells us how that eigenvector would be stretched. So if, if S inverse V is telling us, I have two of the first eigenvector, one of the second eigenvector, three of the third eigenvector, and we multiply by delta, we're going to get out a vector that tells us, okay, how much of each eigenvector we're going to have after we, if we applied A to V. And then we transform back into our original basis, our original way of describing these vectors, which was not in terms where the first element means the first eigenvector. It was just a, it was another basis we were using. Okay, so A, the equivalent of A in the eigenbasis is in this coordinate system associated with the, the eigenvectors is just delta. That is how you describe how A acts if you're in its natural coordinate system. Its natural coordinate system is just taking, it, if you, in its natural coordinate system, if you apply A to something, to a vector, in vector A is, is the vector is described in its natural coordinate system. Applying A to that vector, the equivalent of A, the operation of A, the equivalent operation of A to this vector expressed in the eigenbasis will just stretch each of the existing vectors by that same amount without changing their direction. Okay? So A in our regular basis is the same as the action of delta in the eigenbasis. In the eigenbasis, multiplying by A is just stretching each vector from half to its full size, or from full size to half, or make it twice as long, but staying in the same direction. Okay? That's what this means. I know it'll take a bit of time to, 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 to catch in, but I, I want to move forward to these practical examples. Let's take the flip side. This diagonalization. Okay, we have we can re-express A in the eigenbasis, figure out what its eigenbasis characterization is by taking S inverse AX, okay? Um, to diagonalize A, we just multiply on the left by S inverse. What is S again? Remind me. Matrix of eigenvectors of A. And to diagonalize it, we can just express it in this way. We just multiply it by S inverse on the left and a s on the right. Um, so you get the equivalent of a lambda operates, we start with a vector in the eigenbasis um, and, and get the equivalent vector. So if, if we want something on a regular basis that mirrors the action of lambda and the eigenbasis, we can, we can um, express it in this sort of way with, with a. Okay, I want to talk about these these examples now. So here we have a set of examples. Uh, 
These are linear systems. We've seen that. These are linear systems. And I want to recall with a linear system its characteristics. Okay? Okay. For a linear dynamical system, we've just been talking about matrices in general, and, and none of this right now, up to this point in the lecture of the slides, we haven't been dealing with dynamical systems. When we're dealing with a dynamical system, we're dealing with its change and change in general, which depends on its current state, S, right? Now, for a linear dynamical system, I argued several lectures ago from this podium that we can re-express this as a matrix times that state. So with a linear system, if we have a given state, the rate of change of the system here, S dot, is, is equal to a, some function of state. It depends on the state. That's what makes it a dynamic system. The rate of change depends on its current state. But how does it depend on its current state? Well, it's in a particularly simplistic way. It depends by just some matrix times S, right? And what is this matrix? This is the Jacobian matrix. And we unpacked that before, right? We unpacked it from F, right? We, we saw F sub X is just the rate of change, or uh, just F, the first element of F of S, <laughs> considered as a, ve uh, as a vector, that's the first element of that vector. Um, and here we're dealing with the partial derivatives based on displacement. And I actually say, around S, but we don't need that for a linear system. It's all can be considered around zero. We don't have to make it predicated around a certain point. So in general, we'll just write S dot equal JS, okay, for a linear system. I'm using J to remind us it's the Jacobian, okay? Um, it's the Jacobian associated with this F of S. Okay, now, consider a matrix S whose vectors consist of these eigenvectors. Okay, it's columns of various eigenvectors, right? Just this, this sort of thing. It's columns or are these various vectors. But they're the eigenvectors of what here? Of J, of the Jacobian matrix, of this matrix. Okay, so we've got this Jacobian which comes from from linearizing this fun function, well, but it is linear in this case, so we've got this Jacobian matrix. For a linear system, that Jacobian matrix is going to be constant. It's going to be constant, right? It's not going to depend on state. If it depended on state, if <laughs> this Jacobian depended on state, change for state, we'd have a nonlinear system. But th in this case, it's, it's constant, so we can consider a a matrix here um, of, of the, the eigenvectors of that, right? And more than that, if we have that matrix of eigenvectors of the Jacobian, E1, E2, and so we can rephrase this. Jacobian is equal to this. We're just, because the, the eigenvectors in S are the eigenvectors of the Jacobian. So we can say J equals this. There's some expression of J in, the, in its eigenspace, its preferred coordinate system, its natural coordinate system of J, its own coordinate system, eigenvector, eigenvalue. There's some expression of it in that natural system as delta. Hmm? Do you get that? Okay. And this was just what we did in the previous slides, but we're playing it to Jacobian. Okay, so look. So if we substitute this in, we're just substituting in here, JS, we just get S lambda S inverse S. And look, it, it takes time for me to write these arrows and so on. So I'm just gonna write it as S. I, forgive me, but I'm just gonna write it as S, okay? I like the arrows too, but. 
something that's the small s is the state. It's the state vector. Okay. It's the state vector. It says like you have one susceptible, three infected, and zero recoveries, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, now remember, I said at the start of this lecture that we're going to discover that coupling in these linear systems that we may see nominally, that we may see uh, the, on the surface of things by redescribing it, by changing our coordinate system, by changing our way of describing the system, our naming of the system, that can go away. We can have <coughs> solutions. And here's the thing. Okay, we're going to choose to re-express the system, s dot equal s lambda s inverse s. We're going to choose to re-express it using, instead of s, We'll, we'll have another way of describing the state. It's just a linear combination of the old way. It's, it, it's, it's nothing profound in its, um, in its departure. It's just we'll, we'll use different variables. So maybe instead of using x and y to describe it as the coordinates, um, you know, x, y, and z, maybe we'll describe it as x plus y for the first one. Maybe the, the second coordinate, instead of being y, it would be the, what was originally x plus or x minus z, and maybe the third one will be y minus z. Those are, that's a different way of describing that same system. We've just changed our perspective on it. We've just used a, 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 a different way of naming things. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna choose a way of describing it v, and and v is just a linear combination, just like I said, x plus y and x minus z and y minus z. So it's going to be v, we're going to choose a, a way of describing v that for a given s is just s inverse s. Is that okay? It's just, this is just some, s inverse is just a matrix of numbers and we multiply it by s. It's going to be adding up some elements of s and subtracting them just like I just said. Instead of describing it as x, y, and z, we'll be describing it as what was x plus y, for, we'll, we'll use a different coordinate system where the, the first element will be x plus y, the second element will be x minus z, and the third element will be y minus z, okay? We're gonna be using a different coordinate system, a different way of naming things. We're gonna call, instead of referring to s, we'll refer to, to v. It'll, it'll be a more convenient way to describe it, okay? And it's gonna depend on, on s. If, if we had a, an, a, a vector in s, um, what we can get the equivalent v vector, just our way of describing it in terms of v is just s inverse s, okay? Or equally much so, s equals, uh, if, we, if we have a v, we can always get back what our s would be as s equals s v, okay? So we can go from s describing this in terms of s and describing it in terms of v and vice versa. It's kind of like, um, you remember from high school, probably polar coordinates, right? We could describe this this plane as in terms of x and y. This has a certain value x and a certain value y, right? But we could alternatively describe it as some, you know, radius and some some angle, right? But in this case, it's not even doing that. Maybe it's really just a linear transformation. It's like Maybe we want to describe this as one zero. We want to use a new coordinate system where it's just rotated version of this one, right? Just rotated that way. Or maybe we want to use a kind of weird squished system, you know, where where um, this is one zero down this direction and this is um, this is zero one. But the point is, this is. We can always re-express any point in this linearly. It's a linear transformation of the, of the original coordinate system. And this is the linear transformation. It tells us, given a V, how we get an S, and given an S, how we get a V. And these are just linear transformations, just like S plus X plus Y to go from what used to be the first element to the new first element, or what used to be in the old vector in the first element, et cetera. Okay, I'll let you sit on that. Um, between now and the next lecture. Please please do review this. Okay, so if we're going to re-express this in terms of V, if we're gonna just choose our way of describing the system to use this V, we've chosen a special V. We've chosen a V that's prescient. 
We've chosen a V that's natural, given the Jacobian involved, okay? We've chosen a V that gives us some nice properties. So let's see how those properties play out. So if we have S dot equal lambda S lambda S inverse, then look, if, if, if we have this, we want to describe that in terms of V. Well, well, what is S dot? S dot, S is a, so S is, is just SV. So we plug in SV there, right? For, for where S was. And, and this SV here on the right hand side, so we had S dot equals S lambda S inverse. The S dot on the left turns into SV dot, if we redescribe it in terms of V. And on the right hand side, this whole thing S lambda S inverse S turns into S lambda S inverse SV. Okay, okay, well, doesn't seem we're any further ahead. We've just added mess, goop to things, right? Well, hold, up, hold your horses, hold your horses, okay? Um, we can, let's simplify a little bit. Do you see an opportunity for simplification? What do you see? S inverse S. Well, that's just asking to be simplified. So we'll, we'll sort of telescope that. We'll, we'll, we'll compress it, right? And we have S V equals S lambda V. Okay, well, that's nice, but we still have this pesky S around. How do we deal with that? We multiply on the left-hand side by S inverse, and then we get, because the S is appearing on both sides. So we, assuming S inverse exists, which, which for the system which we're gonna be dealing with, um, or we're gonna be confident about, we, this just means V dot equals lambda V. We've re-expressed this dynamic system as a dynamic system in V. It's the same system, we've just used a different way of describing it. We've just used different you know, labels for, for things. It's the same system. But this system is a special system. Why is it special? Because delta is what? What sort of matrix is delta? It's a diagonal matrix. And what this means is that each element of V is evolving independent of the others. Each one only depends, each state, each state vector of V, each element of, of V, each state vector, each state variable within V, its evolution depends only on its current state. It doesn't depend on the state of any other. This, this is a diagonal matrix, ladies and gentlemen. It's a diagonal matrix. So if we have a diagonal matrix here, it's good stuff, but got to come to an end. Um, OK. Uh, we have a photographic capture. Um, uh, so if we have, you know, some V dot equal lambda V, right? This lambda V is just this lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, all the way down to lambda N or M, in this case M equals N. And and then we've got V, right? Which has these elements, right? So this will give us a vector. And what is it going to be? Well, the first element of this vector will just be this lambda 1 plus the first element of this vector plus 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 times the others, right? The second element of this vector will just be 0 times the first plus lambda 2 times the second element of the, vec of the input vector plus zero, 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 right? So all that's gonna happen is that we will get whatever this is, if this is V1, V2, V3, V4, um, all the way down to Vn, what we're gonna get out is lambda one V1, right? Lambda two V2. It's just each element of the original vector is gonna be scaled by the appropriate lambda. Do you get that? Get or not? Well spoken, Rupai. 
Fucking coding like a pro. Um, God or not. Um, God. Uh, so, so here, we have expressed this system in a decoupled way. The evolution of, of, Um, the evolution of each element here, of V dot, each of these elements of V dot, is just given by an expression depending on itself. Do you see that? Okay. Oh. Okay, I almost I got really worried there. Um, okay. Um, so we've re-expressed this system in a way that's decoupled. But it retains the same number of state variables. I didn't emphasize this, but both V and S have the same number of state variables. We've just turned it from N coupled things into N solitudes. We still have to specify, to specify the state of the system, what its state is, we still have to use the same number of elements of our description, one for each of the state variables. We don't get anything, any freebies here. We're not simplifying it in the sense of describing it more simply, quite the opposite. Now we're describing it in a way that one thing is totally independent of the other. If we have to collect information on the system, we have to collect both pieces of information to pin down the state of that system completely. And if there's n elements of the state vector uh, s, we're in general going to have to depend on n elements of the, uh, we're going to have to specify n pieces of information to pin down where in the system we are. Do you, or do you appreciate that? Okay, so, so V is not simpler in the sense that it allows us to describe the system in a compressed way. It's just that it allows us to describe the system in a decoupled way, in a way that telling one piece of information does not tell you about the others. Right? Um, you know, one is independent of the others. Okay, so how does this play out for our systems? Well, look, here we go. Here's this first one, right? Um, the second order delay. Remember, this is the state variable description. This is the stock and flow description. And this is the state space description. This is the Jacobian. And this is its behavior over time, right? This Jacobian is going to be key because what are we going to do? We are going to take its eigenvectors. We're going to use that to diagonalize it to get to this diagonal description, this decoupled description of the system. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to take its Jacobian. We're going to compute its eigenvectors, which happen to be this, 0, 1, and minus 4, 4, and 0.89. Okay? And, and we are going to then re-express the system in that eigenbasis in that sort of natural coordinate system for this Jacobian. This Jacobian whispers to us that there's a certain natural way of describing this system that allows, it's natural in the sense that it's decoupled. We don't have to worry, we're, each one evolves as a solitude. We don't have to worry about one when we describe the other. But equally much so, information about one doesn't tell us anything about the other in that natural system. But here, if we re-express it using this formula we saw earlier, delta equals S inverse AS, where S is the matrix of eigenvectors, this is the decoupled system. Minus 0.5 and minus 1 here. And these elements on the diagonal, do you recognize this? This is a what type of matrix? A diagonal matrix. And the elements of this diagonal matrix are none other than what? the eigenvalues. So what this is telling us is this system can be described most naturally or in its natural language as according to a system which is decoupled where one element doesn't depend on the other and one of them decays at a rate of 0.5 it's decaying so it's like it'll it'll decay kind of like this over time. Mm -hmm. um, and the other decays at a rate of one, right? And it 
decays faster. Okay, um, and this is a description of the system that brings out its natural modes. We sometimes call these its eigenmodes. Its eigenmodes are changing in this way. It's kind of natural way of describing it has these modes that are decaying in this sort of way. And these modes are nothing more than linear combinations of the original. Let's take a look at this system. Yes, the Lavi. So when we got that diagram, mm. the decay, so the axis, the axis of the vertical axis and the horizontal axis, yeah. would that be I'm describing this in terms of the the V system of uh, how much of each of the it measure the coordinates of uh, determined according to the eigenvectors of the system. So this is in the coordinate system of the eigenvectors, which is just another, it's like polar coordinates versus regular, except that's not, not a, that's a nonlinear transformation. This is actually a, a linear transformation. It's like we, we choose axes that point in a different direction, like 45 degree lines or something. If we describe it in that, this is showing those how much of each of those elements are in it. Okay, um, and you can go from one. You can go from the original way of describing it to the other with these things. If I describe it in its eigen basis, I can figure out what the equivalent state is, or given a uh, state in the original basis, I can figure out what its equivalent point is in eigenspace. Okay. Um, okay, so for this system, which normally is coupled, we have x2 and x, or I call them separately y and x, and, and evolution of x depends on x2 as well as on itself. That's why there's that feedback there and this, uh, uh, this uh, 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 mumble. Um, why? Huh? Um, uh, uh, mumble. Uh, this is the wrong diagram. Uh, what uh, mumble? Uh, oh, oh, these are this is the wrong diagram. I'm sorry. Oh, this is horrible. Um, but w the diagram I meant to show actually has a, a coupled system where the evolution of x depends on what I'll call, uh, or if y depends on x and x depends on x. You could frame it that way. Okay. Is that the next slide. Uh, this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so that uh, so. <laughs> Mumble. This is like uh, an independent one. That's this slide. Yeah, this is this is the one. I'm not sure why that imposter was in there, but this is p and perceived p, and the evolution of p depends on its own sort of dynamics plus uh, the dynamics associated with perceived p. Perceived p depends on uh, here. Excuse me. Perceived p depends on its own previous its own state plus p whereas P depends only on perceived P, okay? Um, and here we go, and here are its underlying state equations. This is its stock and flow description. This is its state space characterization. This is its dynamics over time, and here's our Jacobian. And it looks like a gnarly, tangled system. But lo and behold, you characterize it in the right way, and you can characterize it in a way that is decoupled but uses, what are these? These are imaginary numbers. So it actually requires going beyond real numbers here in characterizing, um, being comfortable with eigenvectors that are characterized in complex terms. So it doesn't always map directly to a a physically intuitive sense uh, nominally about a combination of, of, of uh, variables. Um, because we're out of time, uh, I wanted to just comment on where we're going next time. Ladies and gentlemen, what I've shown you is methods that allow us to, with linear systems, characterize what is nominally a, uh, a coupled system a system where one thing is tangled up with the others, where the evolution of one part of the system depends on the state of the other of itself and, and of other parts of the system. 
We've shown for linear systems how we can reframe that problem re by choosing a different way of describing it or naming it. We can characterize it in a way that's decoupled, where each component depends on its evolution depends on its current state, but only that current state, not the state of other things. Now, that poses opportunities. We can describe the system in a natural way as decoupled solitudes, but it gets in the way if we want to infer from one piece of information about the rest of the system. Because indeed, the, the, the decoupled system, if we have information about any one component, it tells us, it doesn't tell us about the others. We're going to nonlinear systems where the kind of reverse is true. We can't express the system in this linear way. Fundamentally, the Jacobian is not going to be constant anymore. It's not going to be a constant invariant of where we are in state space. And instead, it's going to vary in different areas of state space. This partial, you know, this thing will, far from being constants, which would imply f is linear, we're going to have things like xy within f, you know, f times, or, or s times i. And if we take the derivative of that with respect to a given state variable, say si, the derivative of it with respect to s, we get out i. <laughs> And, and the values of this matrix will depend on the state. Okay. Um, so we cannot decouple the system in this way. We can reason about around fixed points, critical points, these equilibria points, but we can't have one generalization for all of them. We can't decompose it in this way. But the flip side of that is, because it's so tangled, so gnarly, so, so intertwined, when it is not simply reducible to, it can't be described in this irreducible way. Um, we, let's put it this way. With a system like that, with a system like the linear systems, our, way, our simplest way of describing it still gives us the same number of state variables. And in fact, those state variables are independent of each other. And so information about one tells us nothing about the others. But with a coupled system, this is far from the case. Information about one thing is going to tell us a world about the rest of the system. Hints about this particular, from this particular part of the system will whisper to us and sometimes yell to us about what's going on elsewhere and the parts of the system that are driving that. And one of the things that this means is the system as a whole, for a linear system, is just the sum of the parts. We don't get any, we don't, don't get any compression of, of the information about the parts. We've got to go through and enumerate the state of every one of the parts to know about the state of the system. But with a nonlinear system, they're so coupled, just knowing about a few things may tell us all we need to know, really, about the rest of the system. It tells us all sorts of things about the rest of the system, because it's so entangled, the hares and the foxes, that knowing that the hare population is dropping really quickly tells us there's tons of lynx around, or tons of foxes around. Um, and if the lynx are starving, it tells us there's very few hares around. Okay? So that's where we're going. Nonlinear systems as challenge, but nonlinear systems, ladies and gentlemen, from the perspective of system data science, as opportunity. And I close my lecture there. Thank you.